Hi, uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you uh, today for our event on renewable marine energy. Uh, we have the chance to have different attendees from multiple countries, uh, and I think it's a good sign that uh, we need to tackle this uh, subject uh, uh, globally. Um, today, we're going to have a great overview about uh, different technologies and the business models also. Um, I'm not going to be too long. Uh, I'm really happy to organize this event with my partner, SOAADMEC. Uh, I'm actually part of Leonard, uh, which is uh, the innovation and foresight platform of Inchi. Our goal is to is to identify um, key topics and try to gather uh, the best experts to talk about it. It's what we've done today with uh, the, the renewable marine energy. Um, Actually, this event takes place on an event cycle. It's our second event. Uh, we're going to have another one in June uh, about coastal resilience, uh, resiliency. And I just have a quick message for the French uh, attendees. Um, cet événement va être complètement en anglais. Uh, dans quelques jours, nous aurons uh, un replay avec uh, des sous-titres en français. Vous le recevrez directement dans vos boîtes mail. Si vous voulez poser des questions, vous pouvez les poser en, en français. On s'occupera de les traduire en anglais. Vous pouvez utiliser euh, le petit chat sur le côté que vous soyez sur euh, YouTube ou sur euh, Swapcam. For the attendees who are following this event, if you want to ask a question, you can use the chat box and we will be happy to have a, a quick session of Q&A at the end of the round table. So now I will let uh, Benjamin introduce uh, himself and SOA and have a great evening, event. Thank you, Ludivine. It's a real pleasure doing this event with you several years after we, we met in person in San Francisco. So my name is Ben Massage and I represent Sustainable Ocean Alliance. I'm located in, in France. I'm in charge of partnerships and coordinating SOA activities in Europe. For those who are not familiar with uh, SOA, we are a non-profit organization. Uh, headquartered in San Francisco and launched in, in 2014. And we have supported and accelerated uh, several hundreds of solutionists across the globe, 222 to be precise, uh, including uh, 45 uh, ocean uh, tech startups uh, through our um, two flagship programs, that are the um, uh, Ocean Leadership Program and the Ocean Solutions Accelerator. We are very happy to do this uh, series of events with our partner, Leonard, uh, as well as with uh, the Dutch Marine Energy Center, represented uh, today uh, by Yuki, that I am happy to introduce as a moderator of that event. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Benjamin and Ludivine. Um, I'm very happy to be here. My name is Yuki Esser, and uh, Marine energy has actually only been recently on my mind for a bit over a year now. My background is in bioinformatics, but as a sailor, I witnessed the enormous power uh, of the swell and wind firsthand. So I found it so interesting that I started working at uh, the Dutch Marine Energy Center as a business and innovation advisor. And DMAC is the accelerator for marine energy solutions. And a big part of our work is helping developers with their solutions and engaging with policymakers and investors and look for market opportunities. But a very important part is also that we help big corporations get into marine energy and help them understand why marine energy is the next big thing in energy. And that is why I'm really, really happy to be here today and be part of this event. Um, and also that all the listeners and participants uh, are also all here. So thank you so much. And I hope we can give you a sneak peek today into what, why marine energy is important, uh, what is happening in the field and why you should be involved. And so before we start with the round table discussion, I will uh, quickly set the scene because I can imagine that marine energy might not be uh, so well known for all of you. So marine energy is energy from our oceans, our rivers and our seas. And this can be wave or tidal energy, but we can also harness energy from salinity gradients or even from temperature differences in the ocean. And we call this uh, ocean thermal energy conversion or OTEC. So we have wave, tidal, salinity gradient and OTEC, but we're also very close friends with uh, offshore floating solar and wind. So who better to discuss this with than uh, the four experts in the field. Um, 
And at our virtual round table, I cannot see them yet, but at our virtual round table, I'm very happy uh, to have here today Irina Luc, the division manager of Omexon, Marcus Lehmann, co founder and CEO of Callwave, Rita Sousa, partner uh, at Faber Ocean, and Robert Cavaniero from the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Welcome all at our round table. Can you uh, hear me and see me? <laughs> ah, I see Marcus here. Hi. Good to see you. Yeah, hello everyone. And Rita, hi. Hi. And Robert, hello. welcome. Hello. And then we're still waiting on uh, Irina. Ah, perfect. Welcome. Welcome to the round table. So I already uh, introduced myself. It, I thought it would be nice to uh, start with a round of introductions. Irina, maybe uh, you can start. Yeah, sure. Uh, yes, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure joining this round table. Um, Irina Luke is my name. I'm managing director of Omexum Offshore. We are a service provider for the entire life cycle of an offshore power plant. Uh, we are first movers. We started in 2006 and we have seen the industry development from pure uh, engineering imagination to today's state of the art. Uh, ourselves, we have built three offshore wind farms and have about four gigawatts under technical management during the operation phase. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Irina. And thank you to, uh, be, for being here at the round table. And uh, as you already said, Irina will be speaking from uh, the industry point of view. Marcus, uh, if you could introduce yourself next. Yeah, hello everyone. Mark Seaman, co-founder CEO of Cowwave Power Technologies. We are a yeah, wave energy technology provider um, coming out of um, yeah, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in California. And we have currently a pilot unit operational in California for about eight months, which has been really exciting. And we're also lined up for Puck Wave, which is a new 20 megawatt wave farm under construction in Oregon. Nice. Very uh, interested to, to hear more about your technology also during the pitch sessions, because Marcus will also be pitching during the pitch sessions after the round table. Um, and during the round table, uh, we will be hearing from him with his entrepreneurial uh, hat on, <laughs> so to say. Um, Rita, can you uh, go next with this short introduction? Sure. Uh, well, um, my name is uh, Rita. I'm a partner of the Ocean and Climate Tech Funds at Faber, which is um, a, a VC firm based out of uh, Lisbon that has been um, investing since 2013 and with a specialist focused on deep tech and early stage. So uh, I'm partner of the Ocean and Climate Tech Fund within Faber. That is a recent fund um, launched in January. It's a 40 million euros fund launched with 32 to uh, in January to invest in early stage uh, deep tech startups, aiming for a positive impact on ocean sustainability, uh, climate action, and decarbonization of the global economy. Thank you, thank you, and um, very happy to hear your investor and financial point of view today. Uh, and last but not least, Robert, uh, can you uh, introduce yourself? Thanks. I'm Rob Cavagaro. I'm a mechanical engineer and team lead at Pacific Northwest National Lab. Uh, PNNL is one of 17 U.S. Department of Energy uh, research laboratories. We have a, a big portfolio in marine energy research from environmental monitoring to technology development to support for industry. I'm so happy to join today. Thank you. Robert will be uh, speaking from the uh, technological uh, perspective. And when we're talking about technology, uh, I want to dive straight into the first question to you, Robert. And, and for the audience, uh, please don't forget that you can ask your questions also in the chat box for after the round table. Um, but my question to, to Robert, can you perhaps explain to us in a nutshell why there are so many different uh, marine energy technologies? Sure. So uh, it's a really exciting field to be in because it, it's, it's not just a single resource. Marine energy 
uh, as you mentioned, is wave energy, tidal energy, ocean current energy, and then uh, salinity and thermal gradients. And why there's so many different technologies? Because all those resources, they're governed by very different physics. So for current energy harvesting, like tidal or ocean current, uh, it works very much the same way as wind. So a lot of the concepts look similar to wind turbines, but they're adapted for a denser working fluid and a much harsher working environment. So wave devices, uh, they also show a really large diversity of technologies because there are a lot of different ways to capture energy from waves. Uh, you can capture energy from the up and down motion, the side to side motion. You can compress an air chamber or fill a pool. And all of, all these different designs, they can be either near shore, uh, far from shore, they can be in shallow water, deep water. So all these different aspects uh, dictate the types of technology solutions that'll work in these different environments. And then when we're talking about OTEC and salinity gradient, those are, again, completely different technologies, and they may re require things like uh, deep water pipes to bring up cold water to the surface or specialized membranes to get uh, to get power out of the, the gradients and salinity, so chemical potential gradients. So lots of different physics involved, so lots of different solutions. Yeah, really interesting. And we, we will hear some of these solutions during the pitch uh, pitches later on. Um, and I I'm wondering to, to the whole group, if you're hearing about all these different technologies, what do you think the potential is for marine energy in, in 2030 or maybe even 2050 uh, from your point of view? Marcus, maybe as an entrepreneur, we can start with you, but all, please feel free to, uh, to jump in. Yeah, maybe I'm wearing my, my industry association hat. We're uh, part of the U.S. National Hydro Association Marine Energy Council, as well as Ocean Energy Europe. And I think both of these uh, industry associations for U.S. and, and Europe, they target um, yeah, multi-megawatt uh, farms for, for wave and tidal energy and recognize the potential of yeah, up to 30% of um, primary electricity demand for uh, both of these regions could be served from marine energy. Nice. Irina, is it also something that you're uh, seeing? Um, absolutely. I mean, the, the potential is enormous. Um, you mentioned a lot of things, but also having this, this those large areas where you can have floating PV um, and um, we, we have just been part of a F uh, project for um, airborne um, um, airborne kites so also a lot of things are uh, possible i'm always a little bit afraid now this that this does not become a hype now we have conquered uh onshore wind we have conquered pv and whatsoever so we need to find a good balance uh, not to exploit uh, too much especially when we talk about commodities any kind of gases or other commodities but in general it is uh, it's huge opportunity and unfortunately we discovered those uh, too late. Thanks. And Rita, can you maybe um, dive into that as well? And uh, sorry, but maybe if you um, if you move your notebook, I don't know what it is, but we can hear it very loudly. So uh, just, uh, just to be sure, <laughs> maybe it's coming from a different one. Oh, that's um, well. I, I bring the, uh, the the VC perspective, of course, and um, the market analysis, and uh, I think that it's interesting just to uh, put on the table some some numbers of what it can represent um, and um, what these sectors already represent in terms of size and, and mm -hmm. expected growth. Mm -hmm. um, with the offshore wind energy market estimated to represent $87 billion uh, by 2026, growing in the, the, in the past uh, few years at a compound uh, uh, an annual uh, growth rate of 13%. And um, also a growth rate of wave and tidal energy um, uh, estimated to grow at a higher level, um, estimated around 40%. And with uh, being valued already at uh, between three to five billion dollars market size, so the there's a huge market opportunity, huge opportunity as well for these uh, innovative and uh, early stage uh, startups to to uh, 
put forward their uh, innovations and technologies and businesses with innovative business models as well, uh, serving the the market uh, the market expectations and the, the 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 higher market demand for these type of solutions. So, I'm very confident that um, these these numbers will uh, definitely. Um, uh, uh, represent uh, the market in a few years' time. Hmm. Robert, is that also uh, how you're feeling? I think in addition to the, the large uh, grid side of things, I, I really uh, think we're going to see marine energy technologies playing a larger role in powering stuff that happens in the ocean. So mm -hmm. as we expand our economic activities, uh, as the shipping industry becomes electrified, I think marine energy has a very large role to play in powering those ocean economy uh, end use applications. And I also see it as playing a role in large scale climate remediation. So powering uh, large scale CO2 removal technologies uh, and, and other ways to use the ocean to help us uh, tackle climate change. It's very interesting to, to hear from all of you that you all think that there is a potential in marine energy and that these perspectives uh, are also so different and that there's uh, such a huge potential for the whole uh, utility skill, but also the specialized markets that are uh, going on. And I I'm wondering, Irina, if you compare this to to uh, the developments that offshore wind has gone through, Rita already mentioned some some numbers, but what do you think marine energy can learn from the offshore wind sector? Um, well, I'm, I'm not quite sure if the industry marine energy should learn. I think everyone should learn how to, to, to tackle this um, value, um, va value potential industry. And uh, personally, I believe that politics and society have to set clear goals. Mm -hmm. So if we aim for climate change, if that is our main goal, then we have to make sacrifices economy, shipping, environmental protection, animal we we uh, welfare, Navy, and so on, um, will have to step back a bit. Um, so, and if I, I truly believe marine energy is one of the most promising and valuable, and valuable um, next level energy or potentials that we have. So, um, when, whenever I talk to, to various stakeholders, um, I'm not, it might sound a little bit pathetic, but um, I always ask, what is the euro worth um, if you cannot buy a salmon with it because there are no salmons anymore? Or why protect a single dolphin if the sea gets too warm for marine mam mammals in general? So mm -hmm. no matter how the setting is, no, ma no matter how the marine energy shall develop, First, we need to, to, to start as early as possible to discuss priorities and to discuss co-use in an open-minded way, but always with the same goal. So if marine energy um, wants to reach the next level and become what I truly believe, become a serious um, and, and um, natural um, industry, then you sh they sh we shouldn't make the mistake we did with offshore wind only going from from yeah try and error to 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 a thing that uh, we have clear goals and define those and follow those goals. And I completely uh, agree on on that. And if you talk about these these shared goals, can you maybe um, elaborate a bit on how to talk to the greater public about about these goals and how to actually involve them? Um, in these changes? <laughs> it's a, probably a hard question to... Uh... It's a difficult question because <laughs> it's, it's not my answer. It's the answer of politicians um, mm -hmm. to, to be honest about it. I mean, moving on the way we did in the last 50 years, you know where we are right now. I'm looking at the 80s, this, this very famous club of Rome has mentioned what is going to happen if we don't change our daily lives. No one listened because politicians and also economists tend to think in five-year periods. Um, and people are just uh, tired of hearing everything is going to go bad, but nothing happens. Mm -hmm. But sooner or later, and we see it today, I mean, I live in the northwest of Germany. It is very typ uh, typical to have a lot of rain here during spring. It has not rained since 
early April. Um, but people just tend to ignore it. So what can we do is being honest uh, and, and, and say that we have to make sacrifices, that what we had in the past, we, we will see that uh, and we can keep that, but on a reduced level. If we everyone wants to be wealthy <laughs> and healthy, and it's not going to work. Um, and that is difficult for a politician to convince um, people who don't take the time to uh, to listen or to think about the consequences. Yeah, Marcus, is this also something that you're uh, experiencing as a, as an entrepreneur? Uh, certainly, we're seeing a, a strong. I think COVID and, and now the energy crisis in Europe with Ukraine certainly been a wake up call. Um, and yeah, you will hear it in my presentation that software alone will not change the flow of primary energy that is still pre predominantly fossil fuel based in, in the major economies in the world. And so that energy has to come from somewhere and everyone is hoping, waiting for a magic silver bullet that has been under development for many years, but uh, with, with fusion and others. Um, but I think we also have to start tap into all other um, available resources, especially baseload. And in terms of learnings, I see there are enormous synergies and I have a slide on that, um, especially in Europe and now in the US where offshore wind is um, approaching that the entire supply chain from you know, from all three phases of a, of a life cycle of a technology from development to then actual manufacturing construction, as well as then maintenance and operation, that there are existing supply chains from offshore wind that we can tap into. And we at CowWave, we've actually designed our technology from the beginning exactly with that in mind that we can tap into existing supply chains and already benefit from the, the cost curves that brought the cost down for um, all, yeah, all parts along the the life cycle of the technology. Yeah, so so from Callwave, you're actually uh, collaborating a lot with other sectors, as it uh, as it seems. Are there sectors you wish you could collaborate more with? I think, yes, mentioned, uh, we see an enormous potential. I think there are about um, 120 gigawatt of offshore wind um, currently uh, installed and planned. Um, and with 40 to 50% capacity factor, that means there's about 60 gigawatt of excess capacity available um, globally. And so that's an enormous amount of cable that is not being used. And so I think it will be very important for the offshore wind developers to plan ahead and anticipate when marine energy uh, wave and, and tidal, but uh, mostly wave is really ready for um, utility scale farms because there is an enormous opportunity in co-locating them and putting them on the same export infrastructure. And by that, significantly increasing the capacity factor, reducing the payoff time of the cable, and then having all these synergies from spare parts to maintenance um, that can be done is very similar for both um, technologies. Thanks. Yeah, and, and I also uh, heard Irina mention this co-use. Uh, are you already working uh, on that from from the industry perspective in in wind parks? Uh, how what is the what is the field looking like right now? And sorry, was that for me? I, yeah, I missed... sorry, sorry, Irina, is this question? Okay. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, the co-use is is right now is difficult. Um, we started that discussion too late, and now. We see that, um, at least in Germany, uh, we have just increased our um, goals for offshore wind um, to, to a large amount. And we, um, a year ago, we were talking about maybe 20 gigawatts, maybe 15 until 2030, 2035. Uh, now we are talking about 30 gigawatts until 2030 and 45 and 70 gigawatts until uh, 2045. Who uh, very large numbers, and then there's the military or the navy. There's uh, the shipping. There's uh, fishing. Um, there's of course environmental areas. Um, so and now everyone is sitting there and saying, "Yeah, you can do what you want, but not in my backyard. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. not going to work." Uh, and of course, offshore wind has developed and has become an industry. 
now uh, talk to a large utility and say, I'm sorry, you cannot build an offshore wind farm and earn money because um, there is uh, rarely seen bird flying. Um, I don't care about the bird. So I'm, I'm making fun of it, but it's indeed that co-use discussion. Uh, we started too late and it's um, at least my personal opinion as offshore wind industry, we started too late to discuss it and make sacrifices. Mm -hmm. It has started um, and I think it's still workable, but nevertheless, um, there's already a lot of frustration on a lot of, uh, of for a lot of stakeholders. Yeah, 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 I, I can imagine that. And uh, I think it would be good to focus on this positive aspect that it's uh, still possible, but that we really have to incorporate all these different stakeholders and really look at this shared goal that we have. Um, I also heard you mention uh, not in my backyard. And Robert, maybe you can tell us a bit more about um, the, the um, uh, how do you say that? the key selling points of marine energy and why, for example, that they're invisible could help in this whole discussion. Yeah, for for uh, a number of the technologies, they they may actually be underwater. So for tidal turbines, ocean current turbines, those would certainly be submerged uh, out of sight. There, there are certainly environmental around all these types of technologies. There's a lot of research going on to see if that's actually the case. Uh, but because there have been so few actual deployments of large-scale devices, uh, it's hard for regulators to to know, uh, and they mm -hmm. ask a lot of questions. So I think uh, the industry uh, needs to do a better job of of convincing everybody that these are that these are good and safe technologies, and a lot of that has to do with sharing information across developments across countries, uh, and and work really working together uh, to show the benefits. Of uh, and that, that they are uh, safe to the environment. Uh, I know in the U.S. at least the offshore wind industry has been seriously hampered by that, that whole not, not in my backyard uh, sentiment. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot to learn from the offshore wind industry when we're talking about uh, marine energy in the U.S. Yeah. And do you have a, uh, an idea on how to really showcase the, the potential benefits and really the, the advantages of, of marine energy? I think, I think we, we really need to show that, first of all, the technology works, uh, that it's providing real value to, mm -hmm. uh, to the markets that it's serving, whether it's the utility grid or whether it's for powering some of these offshore applications. I think one of the biggest ways to do that is to take it to places where the cost of energy is already very high, uh, and to to show that yes, you can get you can get uh, your electricity from the river that's adjacent to your village. Showing those those cases where it, it has the the ability to uh, greatly impact uh, people's lives in some of these remote communities, and, and people like these kinds of stories, and when they see those successes. Uh, I think they'll be more accepting of larger, larger scale technology. Thanks. Rita, is that also something that uh, you are seeing from the financial uh, perspective? Well, um, definitely. So, <clears throat> so within, within the fund, we, <clears throat> as I mentioned in the beginning, we, we invest in uh, deep tech and early stage um, for um, these innovative uh, companies that are developing solutions with high impacts on the ocean sustainability and, and climate action. So the purpose is really to contribute to the decarbonization of, of the economy. And we have um, different verticals within the fund, and one of them is uh, focused on um, the, enable te the enabling technologies for the development of um, all offshore renewable renewables. Um, mainly we focus on the um, uh, ena enabling technologies that will be um, uh, potentially increasing, enabling the increase of the efficiency, the durability, longevi longevity, lower the environmental impact of the different solutions, their infrastructures. Um, and so this is the type of solutions and technologies that we're looking at. We are looking uh, and and we see a, 
a lot of these technologies uh, were since we're mostly focused in the early stages, so we invest in pre-seed uh, uh, seed tickets early Series A uh, with um, with um, tickets that can range from 100k to um, 1 million, 1 million and a half. Uh, we, we tend to focus on these um, capital, less capital intensive technologies uh, and those enabling technologies for the development of the different technologies that we were just mentioning. Uh, wind offshore, floating solar, uh, wave, etc. So these are the main technologies that we're currently seeing and that we're um, currently having in the in the pipeline um, at European level. So we have a, um, a higher focus in, in, in Europe, uh, being a fund base out of Portugal, we, we do uh, see a lot of companies um, in this space in Portugal, but with, with a broad perspective uh, globally. And um, there's another aspect that is um, important for us. So we, we have to look at those um, technologies that are um, at a technology readiness level that are, uh, of course, um, a little bit more advanced uh, because uh, because of the time to market and um, mm -hmm. lifetime of, of of the fund, which is standard with any fund. So um, mm -hmm. we we need to look at technologies that are um, that we can. And I'm talking about the technologies, but um, at the end of the day, what is most valuable for us is alongside the technology is also the team of the, of the companies that are uh, bringing these technologies up to market. So we, we need to, um, we want to help these uh, teams, uh, you know, and um, from the stage where they're uh, developing their technologies, testing um, first pilots, uh, testing the, 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 the technologies and getting first customers. So that's exactly the space where we are and where we can provide um, our, our support and our added value uh, throughout the expertise of the team, of uh, our network as well. And, and, uh, and, and of course the, the, the settings that we, we, we know best. Um, I, I just would like to um, provide an initial information which is really relevant. Uh, you're, um, we are an impact fund, um, meaning that we look at uh, the companies that <clears throat> um, from an environmental impact perspective can, uh, uh, of course, contribute uh, more to climate change. And this is an important aspect of the technologies that we evaluate, mm -hmm. the ones that can really um, uh, have uh, more meaningful and, and measurable environmental KPIs. So, um, Yeah, really nice to hear that there is uh, so much going on also in, in, in this uh, part of the field. Marcus, if you, uh, um, if you hear this as an entrepreneur, is this something that you also uh, had when setting up your your uh, company, or uh, is this really a recent push? Certainly, yeah. The starting a, a new venture in, in the deep tech uh, requires, of course, excellent and and uh, world class technology development, but then also all the software aspects from team building and um, recruiting and. Um, then yeah, growing, maturing the, the business in um, new areas where in the beginning you really just start with technology and then you have to branch out and um, develop all these little departments where, you know, with, with five people, we, we don't have a PR department and a recruiting department and an HR department that's um, then usually all combined in, in, into one role or a shared role. So I mm -hmm. think for us that has really organically formed over the years. And we got really fortunate to be supported by a program um, that is coming out of ARPA-E um, and um, yeah, embedded in the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab called Cycloton Road. And they specifically saw a gap there. They provided very generous seed funding of half a million in the beginning 
in 2014-15, um, and then mentorship, uh, as well as, um, yeah, I was a PI in the Lawrence um, Berkeley National Lab. So that helped us really to also form the initial team, bring in a, a larger pool of talent, and then really see uh, which of these are entrepreneurial material, essentially. And then kind of we had um, a really strong reset of the company then at the end of 16, after we um, yeah, also contested in US Wave Energy Prize. So that was a really strong um, yeah, practice that, that really helped us to forge the team next to, of course, the technological evolution we went through and, and helped us to arrive at the, and the scalable solution we have today. And so I think reaching out to these um, yeah, support mechanisms, and I think that's been recognized now and a lot of great programs um, regionally, um, often they tend to be more in the digital space because there's more money to be made or easier money to be made. So mm -hmm. it's great to see that there are also more investors specifically focusing on the impact and, and the deep tech space. And of course, we're seeing a lot of money flowing into the software impact space. Um, mm -hmm. And it brings me back to exactly the, that energy chart that, yeah, that, that might help to um, remove some inefficiencies in the system, but it's not going to change the primary energy use. So I think um, the the really big impact and the IPCC really highlighted that um, the really big impact on climate change will come from reduction of fossil fuel, and mm -hmm. that can only be achieved with more uh, renewable energy and, and actual um, energy generation in that space, and, and not so much um, shifting um, software solutions around. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that can only get us so far. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, we're almost already at, uh, at the end of the round table. I'm, uh, I can speak with you for hours on this. I find it very interesting to hear all of your point of view. Um, but I thought um, to have one final question and then uh, have a, a wrap up. So Robert, I was uh, still wondering if if this push forward is also something that you see uh, from the research and technological uh, uh, perspective and and what is happening in the fields there. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of great research going on uh, and it's shared between uh, startup companies like CalWave, uh, academia. There are lots of universities that are active in development of uh, marine technology and uh, sort of the ancillary technology that goes around that. Uh, action on the regulatory front, working with environmental uh, monitoring agencies, uh, those that are that are tasked with making sure that we don't harm the environment that we're working in, uh, and then uh, national labs like uh, the one I'm a part of uh, also play a big role. And I think it's really important for this type of technology development to have strong uh, government industry partnerships, uh, and also recognize the fact that a lot of the technology development starts with government investment. And that mm -hmm. needs to be maintained uh, and sustained uh, to bring these new technologies to market. So I, th I think there's a lot of investment from the government side that's happening, but it, it needs to continue. Uh, and it would really be great if that was not linked to uh, to political whims. So I think mm -hmm. more uh, more consistent investment from, from governments uh, will be required to keep this moving forward, uh, to get it over the hump to a place where it, yeah. it is more like offshore wind. Perfect. I think that's a it's a very good bridge to my final question to to all of you, um, and it actually comes back a bit to the first question where I uh, asked you about the potential of marine energy. So I thought it would also be nice to end with that. Um, so I would like to start with Rita and um, and then go through all of you. Um, and that you can explain what the three steps are that you think need to be taken uh, to scale up marine energy and, and reach our sustainability goals. Rita, go ahead. Well, I, I, would, I would say that um, um, I, I, I totally agree that there's, there's a lack of um, uh, public funding, but I would definitely think that um, another step would be um, of course, um, bringing additional uh, specialty private private funding and VC funding to mm -hmm. to back the the new generation of these uh, of the entrepreneurs that are 
uh, bringing out these this, these solutions to the market. There's a huge market gap in terms of um, funding, uh, specialty funding in VC to be able to bring these uh, help and support bring the the technologies from pilot to to market and support the teams in in this step. And I think that uh, so. Um, blended mechanisms could also be a, a second step there. And, and finally, I, I definitely think that um, um, facilitating uh, the navigation of the regulatory framework uh, is would be a, a third step into uh, enabling um, a, a, an, as, a, as, a, as a driver for uh, to scale up the marine energy solutions. So I think that this would be a, a, a final step that would definitely be very needed. Thank you. Marcus, uh, can you give us your, your three steps that we need to take to scale up marine energy? Certainly funding is a critical element of it to allow more demonstrations. Often these small businesses struggle with the private capital section. So that, that was already highlighted that you know, if, if a pilot costs 10 million and it's at a 50-50 cost share, then as a startup, it can be very challenging to find that that match funding. So that public-private partnerships that allow mm -hmm. um, technology demonstrations, then um, alongside that, really finding the financial mechanisms to incentivize early adoption. So providing, and in the US, I'm, I'm more familiar with the Loan Guarantee Office, for example, so finding market mechanisms that allow project financing of earlier stage technologies that help to bridge the gap because the traditional project financing would only come in with a very mature technology at very large, you know, 100 million plus farms um, kind of scales. And so there's kind of that gray zone and similar alongside that finding market incentives to really incentivize the first, you know, 500 megawatt, first one gigawatt, and so I think the big value marine energy has is that we can produce at times where no one else can at night, mm -hmm. at winter times. Um, so we're seeing a lot of progress in carbon markets, for example, that sometimes create a, a very strange market incentive to actually produce more fossil fuels to then have more uh, carbon offsets to, to be sold and so on. So having, I guess, more lower hanging fruit economic incentives that allow and and create a market pool for technologies that can produce at night and winter times and giving that a price tech um, that will be um, very valuable thanks irina if you uh, can go next with three steps sure um first of all um very most important is having a european commitment for an energy transition not every european country but europe Mm -hmm. um, and then setting goals with a clear roadmap that is thought from the end. So what's the, the, the goal we want to reach and go from there and not starting what could we do until 2040 and then stick to it. It's very easy. Just stick to it. Follow that roadmap. Um, and I've seen in 16 years offshore wind ups and downs and stop offshore wind and extend it and so on. So Following a clear roadmap as a European community is personally for me most important. M money is there, engineering, art is there. Perfect. Robert? For me, uh, the, three, the three big things are uh, the technology demonstration. We need to demonstrate the long-term viability and reliability of these machines. Uh, I also think it's important for uh, continued focus on energy transitions as well, uh, especially for rural and other remote communities. Uh, and then, yeah, continued funding. So very similar to what uh, everybody else was saying today. Yeah, perfect. Well, thank you all so much. I, uh, I personally also learned a lot again uh, from all of your uh, perspectives. I think it's really clear we need uh, a common goal that we need to work to and a roadmap that we have to stick to. And then uh, there are other components that come into play like uh, public and private funding, but also financial mechanisms and market pool. And I hope that there are a lot of listeners today that will also uh, help us in this transition. Um, and speaking about the participants, 
I am going to check if we have any questions from uh, from the audience. Um, let me see. I have one very uh, interesting question. Um, it's, uh, I think, meant for the whole group, but uh, um, if this event was organized again next year, what would you hope to be able to tell us? Is there any uh, one of you that uh, want to comment on that? Or maybe Irina, you can, uh, you are not. Uh, <laughs> it, it would be great to see that the first concepts have been, uh, have been created for an energy grid, a European energy grid. Perfect. And uh, Rob, Robert? I think it would be great to say, yeah, a device that went in the water last year is still functioning. Uh, to talk more about <laughs> successes, success stories. Yeah, yeah, focus on success stories. I like that. Um, Marcus? <laughs> yeah, financial mechanism to incentivize um, new generation technology to help resiliency and um, yeah, full um, transition to 100% renewables. Yeah. Rita, do you have uh, anything to, to add on uh, this great list? Uh, pretty similar to Marcus' comment. So I, I would be very uh, happy to see an uh, increased percentage of VC financing into uh, marine energy uh, uh, solutions. Perfect. Let me see. Um, I think this is a, this is a great way to to end the round table. Uh, we will then now go to, uh, to the pitch ses sessions. And if you still have questions that pop up later in your, uh, uh, that pop up later, then please feel free to still uh, leave them at the question box and we will uh, try to connect you uh, to the right person afterwards. So I would like to thank all of you very much for this interesting discussion. And uh, I hope we can in the future talk more about it and maybe even at a future uh, event talk about all these successes that then hopefully uh, have happened <laughs> um, and to keep this positive note uh, going uh, we will now go to the pitches and uh, we will give the floor to four marine energy developers who will each uh, pitch their solution and uh, talk about why their solution will help in this energy transition um, i don't know if the pitchers are already uh, here I and if so, we will start with uh, uh, Isaac Rubenstein from EcoWave Power. Hi, I can see you there. Perfect. So Isaac is a business development professional at EcoWave Power. Uh, and EcoWave Power is a leading wave energy company that develops uh, patented, smart and cost efficient technology for turning oceans and sea wave into green electricity. Well, that sounds very promising. Isaac, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yuki. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for the amazing roundtable. It was, it was really interesting. So I'm going to share here my screen. Let me see. OK. So yeah, as kindly introduced by Yuki, my name is, is Isaac Rubinson. I'm I'm a business development professional at EcoWave Power. EcoWave Power is an innovative Israeli company that was founded in 2011, and the company has developed an innovative technology to produce clean and affordable electricity from ocean and sea waves. And so today, I'm, I would like to tell you a bit more about our technology, about our company, and why do we see, how do you think that, that wave energy will be a significant part of the energy transition? So the first question, of course, is why wave energy? And well, wave energy has a lot of advantages. First, a simple geographical advantage, over half of the population lives within 200 kilometers of a coast. So most of the global population lives close to a coastline. Therefore, of course, producing energy in such locations require less infrastructure and less transmission costs in general. In addition, 
In addition, wave energy is more stable and more predictable than other renewable sources, such as solar and wind, for example, and the power of the waves does not go away with the sun or with the clouds. In most suitable places, wave energy can be produced around the clock. The, in addition, the, the wave energy has a higher energy density in comparison with, with other renewable sources. For example, wave energy has 832 times the kinetic energy of wind, for example. So that means that we can produce the same amount of energy with significantly less space required. And in addition, the potential is immense. According to the World Energy Council, wave energy can provide twice the amount of electricity that the world produces now, representing an over 1 trillion euro market. So the question is, if wave energy has all those advantages, uh, the question is why it has not been commercialized yet. And the reason for that is that the, the industry, the wave energy industry until now, have been struggling to commercialize because most, most developers are looking for install on the offshore. And okay, the, of course, the, the waves are higher on the offshore, but, but it's uh, more difficult to commercialize as these systems are really, really expensive and complex. It's really, um, they, they require the use of ships, divers, underwater cabling for simple basic operation and maintenance activities. So it's really expensive and complex. In addition, these systems, they are, they're also exposed to, to really like harsh environments where waves can achieve uh, up to 20 meters and completely destroy the system. Also, the, 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 the hydraulics and the electrical companies are more exposed to the, the, to the water and to the, to, to the offshore environment. And because the, due to these reasons, it's more difficult to obtain suitable insurance for these power stations. And they have a certain, some of them, uh, depending, they have a, a negative environmental impact because the offshore systems, they need to be attached to the ocean floor. So they create a new presence in the ocean and, and, and can disturb marine life. So due to these reasons, uh, the, the, the wave energy field has been struggling to commercialize its technologies because they're mostly located on the offshore environment. EcoWave Power has taken a completely different approach, developing a unique technology which is located onshore. So we basically attach our, we install our system on existing structures on the shoreline and only the floaters are located on the water. All the electrical and hydraulic components are located on land, just like a regular power station. So how does our technology work? We basically attach our floaters to existing structures on the shoreline, such as piers, jetties, and breakwaters. The floaters move up and down with the movement of the waves, compressing biodegradable hydraulic fluid. This creates pressure in a land-located accumulator, which is used to turn a hydraulic motor, which then turns an electric generator, producing 100% clean electricity and sending it to the grid. Our technology is fully patented, including a, a, a unique patent for our storm protection mechanism, which I'll also show later. So with this technology, EcoWave Power has been able to overcome the difficulties of the offshore systems that I have mentioned. Developing a solution that has zero environmental impact because we don't need to attach our floaters, we don't need to attach our system to the ocean floor, so it does not create any new presence in the ocean, it does not disturb marine life. In addition, the technology is cost efficient as we utilize existing infrastructure, significantly reducing capex, the, the initial investment required for the for the project, as well as the, the operation and the OPEX, the operation and maintenance costs as we don't require ships, divers, underwater cabling for, for daily operations. We, we can do all these the operation and maintenance activities from the land side. And it, also the technology is reliable. And since only the floaters are located on the water, all the electrical and hydraulic components are located on land, isolated from the harsh marine environment. Actually, in this video, we can also, we can also see our storm protection mechanism in action which automatically raises the floaters into the upper position in the, in the case of a storm, protecting the system against any damages. And, and due to all those reasons, all the EcoWave Power power stations are fully insurable by global insurance companies in accordance with market standards. With this technology, EcoWave Power has been able to achieve significant milestones in a short period of time. In the beginning, in 2011, EcoWave Power performed detailed studies and wave tank testing 
to really optimize the, the design and the shape of our floaters and our system. And then in 2014, EcoWave Power installed a power station in the port of Jaffa in Israel. And this power station is, is currently being expanded in a partnership with EDF Renewables, a subsidiary of the French National Electrical Company. And we have also established a strategic partnership with Siemens, who is responsible for all the electrical subsystem and, and grid connection of the power stations. This project has been recognized by the Ministry of Energy of Israel as a pioneering technology, and the Ministry of Energy also contributed with part of the funding for the project. Then in 2016, EcoWave Power installed a power station in Gibraltar, which is the only wave energy power station in the world that is connected to the grid under a, under a power purchase agreement that we have with the government of Gibraltar, uh, a PPA of 5 megawatts with the government. And this project has received funding from the European Regional Development Fund and from the Horizon 2020 programs. So now that the technology has been widely tested and proven, EcoWave Power is rapidly expanding its global pipeline of projects towards commercialization, having secured more than 325 megawatts of projects in the pipeline worldwide. And this goes from projects at the more earlier stage of development to projects at a more advanced stage, for example, the such as our project that we are currently developing in Portugal, that we have recently entered into a, a concession agreement with the port of Leixões for the development of an up to 20 megawatt power station in the port. And we are already finalizing the, the licensing stage for the first stage of the project. So our goal is really to to see the EcoWave power technology implemented in basically any location in the world that has a breakwater. Our company and our technology have also been featured on the main media channels. For example, the Wall Street Journal, Journal has recently published an article stating that EcoWave power is one of the bets for the future of renewable energy. And our technology has also, and our company have been recognized by, by several major global institutions, for example, the Sustainable Markets Initiative by the Prince Charles. Also, the, our technology has been labeled as an efficient solution by the Solar Impulse Foundation. And also, for example, the United Nations has, has been awarded, uh, EcoFR has been awarded from the United Nations the Climate Action Award during COP26. So we are really, really excited with the future of EcoWave Power. So here we're opening to you an opportunity to, to join us in our journey. And we're always open to discussing potential partnerships for the development and implementation of our wave energy projects. And we're really, really happy to be changing the world one wave at a time. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Isaac. It's a wonderful presentation. Really nice to see uh, what you're doing uh, and that you're changing the future one wave at a time. It's a perfect yeah. slogan. Um, our next speaker is uh, Roy Isai. He's a project manager from uh, Geocean. And Geocean is a French EPCI contractor with more than 35 years of experience in uh, developing projects worldwide for marine and offshore industries. Geocean is uh, actually part of the um, organizer of this event, the Vinci Group, and Roy has been uh, managing Geocean SWAC projects in, in French Polynesia. So, Roy, the floor is yours. Roy, you're on mute. Hello. Yes, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. I'm very happy to be here today, representing the uh, Geocean and the, the solution we've been working on, uh, which which is called the Seawater Air Conditioning, uh, short for SWAC. So uh, basically, SWAC is a is a green and sustainable, efficient cooling method that does not produce energy as electricity but it serves in uh, preserving uh, and saving energy while uh, producing cooling, which is a, a, a need in 
in lots of places on this on this earth as you know uh, and especially from the projections we have from the international energy agency we know that in the next 30 years the need for cooling is going to triple so that's a worldwide need uh, represented in electrical consumption and uh, this solution that we've worked on and already implemented on projects worldwide uh, is used to absorb a big part of this need for specific clients that are next to bodies of water and as we've seen previously that represents a lot of people around this uh, this planet uh, so again, the the uh, the numbers speak for themselves. Uh, the cooling is cooling outlook is pretty is pretty aggressive in a lot of areas of the world that are in need of expansion and uh, population growth will bring on uh, need for cooling and as things go today, need of electricity because the main way that cooling is generated is using the electrical grid. Uh, so that's on one part. On the other part, the problem is that the the standard cooling solution which are air conditioners basically chillers and others but even chillers which are the best in class has a have efficiency ratios of around three uh three or four for the for, for the average whereas uh the swag which i'll present uh just the slide after that is ten folds more than that so it's an efficient efficiency ratio of 60 in medium so so that's 10 times more uh, efficiency than the normal solutions we have uh, we have today. So what is SWAC? Basically, a SWAC is, uh, the concept is pretty easy to understand. Uh, all around this earth, uh, we have, we have uh, cold temperature, which is available in water, uh, in depths that are ranging between 700 to 900 meters, depending on the ocean. Uh, and if we can pump this water uh, and circulate it in an open or closed loop, then we can use it to generate uh, cooling in the, in the client's building. So in a very easy way, uh, we install this infrastructure, uh, which is the pipeline and all the heat exchangers and the, the cooling uh, loop needed to pump the water into the client's, um, into the client's building. And then that cold water generates cooling the water itself is heated back up to the temperature uh, of, of the water on the surface and then it's rejected back in the sea so the same water without without any other treatment is coming in cold and then coming back at the surface temperature it's a technology which is proven because uh, it has already been implemented and so clients of ours are using it since 10 years now uh, it requires a body of water which is nearby uh, the cooling need so it's perfectly adapted for islands specifically. And it's, as we see, it's economical in the sense that once the infrastructure is installed, the return of investment is pretty quick for an infrastructure of this size and environmentally friendly and on several aspects, uh, be it uh, the fact that it, it's not, it doesn't disturb the, the marine life. The, the, the interference with marine life is pretty minimal. Um, there's no visual disruption because everything is, uh, below water or buried on the beach and the interventions on the beach are pretty uh, are not very are not, not more aggressive than normal uh, beach infrastructures so why is like also we when we calculate the need for cooling we see that it's it's uh, focalized in these areas and specifically within these areas on the globe around the tropics uh, islands uh, struggle to generate clean electricity so most of the electricity generated on island for now are highly carbonated. If we take as an example in France, speaking top of my head, 70% of the French mainland electricity is generated by nuclear. You can debate if it's clean or not, but it's not carbonated. Well, in French uh, outer territories, which are islands in the uh, Caribbean or in the Pacific, uh, it's 70% more or less carbonated. So uh, even for countries that are European, uh, islands represents a specific challenge. And these technologies, this technology, which is uh, help it helps preserve the uh, the electricity and doesn't uh, and, and and saves basically the need to to uh, fabricate it helps especially islands and isolated areas that are not inter interconnected to a grid that is decarbonated. So these are our main targets, and uh, the projects that we have been involved on are mainly. Uh, mainly focused in the Pacific area, so uh, French Polynesia, and 
on the Indian Ocean, uh, La Réunion, the island of La Réunion. I'll take a practical example uh, on a project that we've delivered recently. So it's the uh, fit up of the hospital, as you can see it on the upper left picture, uh, the hospital of Papete uh, in French Polynesia uh, has switched from normal cooling to cooling by deep water air conditioning, so deep water, water um, pipes. Uh, and we delivered this project last year. A couple of figures, so just we, we can see what we're talking about here. The pipeline length is four kilometers, so it's pretty short for an infrastructure of this type. And that's on the intake, and a couple of hundred meters on the outfall, so the the pipeline going back back with the heated up water, which matches matches the water temperature where it's being discharged. And then, so these type of projects, we can uh, we can design them from from the feed to the delivery construction, and then the maintenance until passing it back to the client uh, to ensure the maintenance on the duration of the life of the projects. This infrastructure, uh, one of the big advantages that it's, uh, the longevity is pretty, pretty big. It's around 30 years, 30 to 50 years with minimal maintenance. That does require uh, every three years some uh, subsea maintenance, but the, most of the operations are done onshore. The pumping operations are done onshore. And uh, practically speaking, to, to talk about some figures, we've already deployed the solution for for three clients uh, with tangible return on their uh, on the saving, be it uh, environmental. So uh, the the hospital of French Polynesia is expected it's its first year so first year of operation now, so it's expected to be saving around five tons five thousand tons of CO two emissions, uh, around twelve gigawatt hours of electricity per year. That is not being so that's removed from the grid of Tahiti because of this technology and other clients which are uh, more hotel hotels uh, are doing the same are already operating it since 2012 and uh, the most recent one we just delivered it last week and this solution has been deployed now in in places like French Polynesia which are very stringent on the environmental aspect and protection of uh, of marine life uh, without any negative feedback during the operation or the design or the construction period so we are we are very uh, confident that it can be deployed everywhere worldwide where the need is so where we need cooling and where the potential lies so where we have access to uh, to oceans uh, with high benefit on the environmental and cost aspect and low impact on the uh, on the marine life uh, where we pump the resource. So I might have gone quicker than expected, Yuki, but I'll be happy to take any commentaries afterwards. I'll give you back the, the mic. Thank you so much, Roy. Really uh, interesting to hear about this technology and to hear about all the work that you're already doing. Um, and uh, SWAC is actually part of uh, of the entrepreneurship of Leonard. So uh, it's really nice to to have you here at this yeah. event. Yeah, and we're happy to have Leonard head this also. And perfect, <laughs> perfect. Thank you. Um, and for everyone that has questions or want to check out more, uh, there are the boots of all the speakers, uh, so you can uh, get in contact with Roy over there. And our next uh, speaker is Marcus Lehmann, who we already met during the round table. And he will now tell you more about his technology. So finally, uh, talking more about CallWave. Very uh, interested to hear about what, uh, what you have to present and, um, and what CallWave is doing. Marcus, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Yuki, and let me know, can you, oh, yeah. there you go, share the screen. Can you see that well here? I cannot see the, it's loading. Yes, I see uh, the presentation, but not in presenter mode yet. Okay. Perfect. Does that we work? Can, yes, but we can also see uh, um, the note, so it's not in Oh, the then I'll just leave it so we yeah, have an perfect. external screen. <laughs> All right. Great, yeah, <laughs> thanks again. And uh, I'm Mark Seaman, co-founder CEO of CalWave Power Technologies. We're based in um, Oakland, California, and yeah, European subsidiaries. And yeah, as mentioned earlier, that's really the harsh reality of um, yeah, large scale electricity and, and energy flow 
where the majority is still coming from fossil fuel. And as of now, it does not look like a rapid change will take place here unless we really start to adopt um, yeah, more forms of renewable energy as quick as we can. And California is a great example where already about 30% of solar, we see enormous curtailment rates um, growing exponentially, as we can see here. And so that shows the, the overbuild of um, volatile renewables will only get us so far. And I think island and microgrids are a good forecast into the future there where people have tried and often it's um, yeah not economical to just overbuild storage and solar to, to get to 100%. And so here, ocean energy, specifically wave power, can great, uh, provide a great advantage, um, which we heard some of the benefits earlier, um, yeah, more dense, um, consistent and predictable. And so this is kind of a, a global chart of um, ocean energy and a wave power. And we can see that most of the energy is actually available offshore. Um, waves start to interact with the ocean floor as they reach the shoreline and they actually lose their energy. So between uh, offshore wave power and shoreline wave power, it's um, already half of the energy is lost. So um, if we really want to capture that um, power efficiently, yeah, we have to go out a little bit. And as mentioned in Europe, um, yeah, the trade association Ocean Energy Europe really forecasts that 30% of US electricity demand could be provided by wave power, as well as create um, a lot of jobs. And this is a great map from offshore wind. We're seeing here the different hubs um, of expertise, as well as the um, respective areas for wave and tidal energy. So there's an enormous opportunity to um, leverage these existing resources and supply chains and yeah, create a lot of more jobs. And yeah, that's really a summary on where um, we see offshore wind going. We heard some pretty large numbers uh, for Germany in the, the panel earlier. Um, as of now, globally planned, um, yeah, I found um, citable sources of about 120 gigawatt and with a capacity factor of 40 to 50 percent. That means we have about 60 gigawatt of excess capacity um, of cable capacity offshore. And so that's a pretty large number. That's an equivalent of 60 nuclear power plants. And so there's an enormous opportunity to use that unused um, yeah, electrical infrastructure. And so what we're seeing here is that wave power is really not competing, but complementary to wind and solar. Um, we see the very stable production profile on a daily basis, and then kind of the counter um, cyclical on an annual basis where wind and wave together really show great synergies. There was a Stanford study that found yeah, the joint capacity factor from these two combined annual profiles can really be significantly higher um, than a standalone wind farm. And no different than a wind turbine um, for wave energy, the fundamental challenge is that we have to produce very efficiently where most of the energy, most of the occurrence, um, so most waves happen from the one to six meter kind of range. But then, um, yeah, every 50 years, we have these very large events. And so the wind industry has solved that problem with pitch and yaw control, the ability of the blades to turn out of the wind when um, yeah, the speed gets too large, the forces get too high. And so for wave power, no one really had found such a solution that has high performance where most of the energy is offshore, as well as then the ability to shut it down. And so in 2015, the Department of Energy started the US Wave Energy Prize to really start from a clean sheet and also have an apples to apples comparison with um, yeah, standardized testing and, and third party testing requirements. And our team entered together with 92 teams and we progressed over four life cycle stages. So they did um, yeah, in, in every of the four stages, a life cycle assessment and then down selected the best technologies and invited the best nine to that third party um, testing in the US Navy tank. And yet at the end of the um, competition, we were able to achieve the highest performing device um, as well as the device with the lowest um, yeah, extreme response um, to, to extreme waves. So our shutdown mechanisms really have been validated there. 
And with these great results, we won a follow-on award from the Department of Energy in 2017, then started to build our drivetrain in 19. With COVID-19, we got delayed significantly, but then we're finally able to manufacture um, shortly after. And then last September, we were finally able to install our pilot unit in San Diego. And that has been now operating for close to eight months in two, three days. It's going to be eight months continuously um, without any downtime. And so we can see our technology floats like a vessel. Um, so for installation, even small vessels can be used um, to tow it and install it. And then we operate fully submerged. That allows us to get really high efficiency, extracting energy from multiple degrees of freedom. And then at the same time being submerged, that allows us to use the water column to shelter from storms. So we can lower the system in the water column and we have two additional mechanisms that are independent. And with that, we can become invisible in storm conditions. And that's exactly the two criteria that um, um, any renewable hydrokinetic device has to meet high efficiency on the one hand, the other, the ability to shut it down in extreme events. And by that, the forces for these extreme events become in the same order of magnitude as your operational forces. And that really makes a lean um, capex um, low structure. And yet during these eight months of testing, um, we're already months over. Initially, we were funded to test for six months, but because we had no um, downtime, um, we just um, yeah, kept running the system um, for now over two months and continue um, planning to continue operating a, a couple more months. And these were the main six areas we wanted to demonstrate and validate. And yet yeah, since November, we've been operating fully autonomously. So our autonomous controller we've adopted from the wind industry um, has the ability to shut down the system yeah, um, autonomously um, based on environmental parameters. And yeah, we don't need any additional wave buoys. It's really what we measure on the device informs the, the transition from operations into part load to then full shutdown and, and shelter in storms. And yeah, we've already experienced a, a scale 50 year storm representative for the 50 year storm in Oregon, as well as a minor tsunami. And yeah, our system really has proven the um, yeah, survivability in, in all these conditions. As mentioned, we're coming initially out of UC Berkeley and the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab with support from Cyclotron Road and Activate, and then yeah, received support from Breakout Labs um, and, and many others. Um, and yeah, just highlighting here the Sustainable Ocean Alliance, which has been really a great partner um, for many years now. We were in the first cohort of um, solutions. And yeah, um, in total, we've secured now um, 19 million in contracts from the Department of Energy, um, including a, a latest award in January. And that allows us now to upscale the system to a second product line and demonstrate that in Oregon at the new test site. And yeah, we currently have a, a quite active um, dialogue with the private sector investments. Um, so yeah, please feel free to reach out um, afterwards to learn more. And yeah, as mentioned, Puckwave is a new test facility in Oregon, rated at 20 megawatts, um, having yeah, four independent cables. And yeah, we're one of the companies lined up to deploy once that site is ready and it's fully pre-permitted and um, um, grid connected. So there's very low planning um, yeah, and security for us um, to be able to execute this project. And we can see this is about seven miles offshore to reach the energetic area, as well as then stay out of fishing and crabbing um, activities. And so we're now planning to install and operate um, our larger system um, in the coming years. And so overall, we're seeing um, wave power being at an inflection point at the moment for technical, but also for commercial reasons. Technically, it's really the results of the wave energy price resulting into a viable, scalable, and then cost competitive solution. The cost of simulations has decreased um, substantially even over the last couple of years. Um, the, the amount of time domain simulations, detailed um, analysis we can do now on board with our digital twin only, the, the former um, 
you know, oil and gas industry was able to really afford this level of simulations. And now with open source tools we've adopted from the national labs and, and others really allow us to have that very high detailed um, yeah, set of simulations that really allow now to unlock the challenge between performance and shutdown. And then also facilities like advanced hardware in the loop, which we've adopted, really allow it to test equipment before even going out in open ocean. And as a result, yeah, we have that really high reliability of 99% uptime in the very first deployment we've executed. And from a commercial perspective, we're seeing the growth of offshore wind really being beneficial in, in Europe, but also in the US now. The um, you know, financing landscape becomes more and more attractive for renewable energy adoption. And then also, yeah, facilities like Puckwave and, and others um, in Europe that have already pre permitted. Um, yeah, cable um, really allow the, the early um, or quicker adoption of these technologies. And just to round up, um, yeah, the Ocean Perfect. Energy um, Association um, really targets about 500 megawatts of wave power by 2030. So that's a um, substantial percentage of the European electricity demand. And that can greatly help to yeah, reduce the reliability of imported fossil fuels from Eastern Europe, for example, as well as then help to transition to 100% renewables. And yeah, with that, I'm glad to um, answer some questions. And yeah, please visit us at cowwave.energy or reach out to Marcus at cowwave.energy. Thank you so much, uh, Marcus. It was really interesting uh, to hear about the developments and also hear about the synergies of, of wind and solar. and. Uh, I, you said a nice sentence that uh, WAVE is not there to compete, but to be complementary to wind and solar. I, I really like that. And with that, we go to our last speaker, um, Anders Kuller from uh, Floating Power Plant. He's the CEO. And Floating Power Plant is a Danish company that is uh, taking combined wind and wave technology to market and often uh, also in combination with hydrogen. So Anders, I'm really uh, happy that you're here. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, can you see my slides? I hope you can. Not yet. Uh, not yet. Let's see if I can share them again. Should be sharing now correctly. I cannot. See. Yes, it's loading. Yes, I can see the PowerPoint. And I'll switch it. Okay. Yes. Very good. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So. Good afternoon, everybody. As, as introduced by Yuki, my name is Andrews, and I, I run Floating Power Plant. And as you can see in the picture, we develop this technology that combines floating wind and wave, uh, and sometimes often also integrate hydrogen. Uh, and it's exciting times. We are taking this into the commercial market, uh, first contract secure. So, so it's 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 a it's a thing that is progressing. But just to give you a little bit of highlight of who we are, then we are a Danish company. We are based in Spain and the UK as well. We are owned by 240 shareholders, including the Danish utility Erstel. Uh, we have raised over 20 million get to, to get to where we are today. Most of that is, is equity. Uh, we don't do this alone. Uh, and I can see other people uh, presenting here today have the same strategy. We have teamed up with some very large partners from Siemens Energy to Technip to Seafront, uh, who are playing a valuable part in developing technology, but also in, in de-risking and, and building the value chain for commercial build out. We have a very good board and we will always have, uh, but you can you can check that out on, on our homepage. So if you look at, at the technology in, in brief, then it consists of a, a floating uh, platform. That's what you have up here. It's called a semi-submersible. It's the same way you make a stable oil and gas platform. We have just cost optimized it a lot. And then we build it out of panels. So the same way you build ships, which is cheap and fast and modular, meaning, meaning we can multi-source this. On that, you can put on a turbine, currently up to 15 megawatts, which is what we are modeling with and, and, and also have projects with. Uh, a platform like that cannot sail away, so you need a mooring system. Again, we use a oil and gas technology simplified a lot. It's a single point mooring, meaning the entire platform and wind turbine and wave power can be built at key site, tested, commissioned, sailed out, connected. If something goes wrong, you can disconnect and, and tow it back. The power needs to go to shore, so that is via an electrical cable or to a, a off-grid installation. And then the last part is the wave power we are integrating into to this platform. 
as you can see in the videos, we have tested this at, at half scale. So in an offshore environment together with Erster, we have been grid connected with one of the wind farms. We extreme testing and, and a lot more, but I'll, I'll come back to that. So we, we are not new in this. We have been here for, for over 10 years, taking the technology from concept level uh, to four offshore test phases in different stages to make sure that each of the technology elements are tested correctly. We do a lot of component testing, dry testing, uh, and right now we're doing a lot of uh, certification testing, validation testing together with clients for different projects. We are also building the biggest dry test facility for wave power in the world. And, and a key driver for us is when you develop technology, you need to have your client there, uh, or at least a client representative. So we are working with companies from both oil and gas and the renewable market industry when we are when we are doing stuff like this. When you combine wind and wave, uh, then you get a, a unique market segment. Uh, to put it in perspective, the red area, that's where you, where you have low water depth, uh, good wind, and uh, a decent, uh, not too much wave power. That is where you see Denmark, Germany, Belgium, Holland, England pouring out offshore wind on fixed foundations by the gigawatts. But the rest of the world is different. So just looking at Europe, uh, the orange, blue, and green areas, that is where you would need uh, floating wind or, or wave power. Uh, in the orange areas, that's not us, there's good wind, but no waves. Where we bring significant competitive advantage to other floating wind or offshore wind is in the green and blue areas, where you have a lot of wind and a lot of wave, meaning you even have more wind, meaning even higher capacity factors on your wind turbine. And of course, also having uh, the wave resource on top. As has been said many times today, wind and wave uh, uh, are quite complementary because uh, waves lack wind. And, and of course, we are very, very focused at, at having a highly scalable and, and modular design. So most of our projects are in these green and, and blue areas. Um, we are going to market in, in a, what we call a multi-market segment approach. Uh, we are a technology provider, meaning we sell technology. And of course, we are uh, looking for the, the large grid-connected offshore wind farms, where our offering is very focused at power quality and cost of power and uh, the modular, modularity that we can build them fast and cheap. But just as importantly, and over the th last three years, uh, what we are doing in what we call the power to X market, which is small or medium uh, off-grid or weak grid projects like electrification of oil and gas or electrification of uh, larger remote islands has just growing rapidly. Uh, and that is because we, we work a lot with, with higher quality of, of power, which I will come back to in a, in a moment. But if we look at just the floating wind market, uh, I'm not going to go through all this, but just to take one, Scotland, I don't know if you're all aware, has just run the largest leasing round for offshore wind in the world. That is 25 gigawatts, where 15 gigawatts of that will be floating. To put that in perspective, then Scotland's current generation capacity, including everything, is 5 gigawatts. So a lot of this, if built out, will come in as hydrogen or, or other sources just to take a few examples of, of what countries are doing here. Um, when I say we do a lot of work in, 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 in power to x also with oil and gas, that was actually coming from us uh, presenting at a oil and gas conference where we showed our value proposition of more power, cheaper power, designed of proven systems, uh, better power quality, accessible. Uh, and that actually led into a very large project for an oil and gas operator in Norway called Lundin with support from Equinor and AKPP and a lot of other companies saying, how do you actually begin electrifying uh, off-grid or weak-grid applications such as oil and gas facilities? And when we completed that project, we got a project for Total in Denmark they challenged us even further, saying, well, if we are to electrify, if we are using renewable energy offshore, it has to have the same risk profile as a gas uh, generator, or the, in other words, they wanted constant dispatchable renewable power. And to do that, we had to team up with Technip FMC, which is a large global EPCI, but also one of the leading developers of hydrogen, offshore hydrogen in the world. And we made an integrated design where we in our floater, so it's still wind and wave, have a deck with, with hydrogen, so we can produce hydrogen, store hydrogen, and, and make power from hydrogen again. So the principle is very simple. Uh, when there is wind and wave, you provide power to the, to the asset. When there is too much wind and wave, you turn it into hydrogen. And when there is too little wind and wave, you turn it into power via fuel cell. But the key thing here is that we can store 300 megawatt hours of electricity on each platform. 
And that is, uh, if you Google how much that is, if you're not quite sure, then it is bigger than some of the biggest grid connected batteries in the world. And, and that is actually a game changer. And because of that, and what we have seen over the last three years, then our go-to-market strategy is, is very, very clear. We are working uh, initially with electrification uh, of oil and gas. We then we are working with uh, electrification of remote islands, and we are already with Technip working on on facilities uh, designs for for green hydrogen export. The reason for that is the projects are smaller; they're still big. There is limited competition, higher margins, uh, and a very very fast to, way to market because we don't need a tariff and we don't need a grid connection. So this is uh, uh, of course very attractive to us. Uh, that's that's it. We are still engaged in the floating offshore wind market, which uh, I'll show you in a moment. But these projects are a lot more competitive, and and we need to get things up in scale and down in cost to make sure that we win these contracts we we have here. So what do we have on the execution? Well, we are building a large commercial demonstration project in, in Spain with wind, wave, and hydrogen. That will be a, a global flagship. We are doing design projects for oil and gas operators. Uh, our pipeline uh, on top of that is, 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 is quite large, just in the floating wind market. So grid-connected projects, we are engaged in four projects in, in Ireland and Scotland, all of uh, uh, of, of close to a, a couple of gigawatts. And in the oil and gas market, we're working you know, in the power to x market with over 15 oil and gas operators now, and they are coming in faster than we can. And we are also uh, uh, working with the two projects in remote islands. So we are we are growing and growing. Uh, we are hiring eight people right now. So if anybody wants a job, please send us an application. But we are also at a place where we need to scale and we need to scale fast or sell the company. So we are actually in the middle of a funding round where we are taking in a large global EPCI partner to be able to provide warranties and balance sheet that is closing. They're putting in 16 million and then we are in a equity round for just over 30 million going quite well. We just started and the first financial cornerstone of 10 million is already in place. So that is will be closed within three months from, from today. And on top of that, we will be taking in some debt for, for the project in Spain, but we already have support from, from EIB and, and other entities for that. So I think the short version from us and what you have heard today is that uh, the transition in the, the offshore environment, the marine environment is, is coming. And uh, I'm glad to see so many technologies presented today with different applications because there is a multiple of green applications and it's about finding the, the right segment for, for, for your technology and do that. And of course, if you want to know about more about what Want to know more about what we do then of course reach out to us and 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 we will gladly uh, share more so i think that was that was it cool. I, thank you so much anders it's uh, really great to uh, hear more about your routes to markets and uh, this brings us to uh, the end of this event. I uh, am very happy that you were all here. Thank you so much. And also very happy that uh, we from Dutch Marine Energy Center were uh, able to help organize this event and, uh, and moderate it. If you're a developer or a policymaker, an investor, or a big corporation uh, that wants to uh, get involved in marine energy, you know where to find us. We have a booth here and it can be reached on DutchMarineEnergyCenter.com. And with that, I uh, give the, the floor back to Ludivine <laughs> for the final uh, conclusion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yuri, and thank, and thank you to all our panelists and our speakers. Uh, I think that it was quite impressive, uh, the different solution we, we had at the end. Um, I think that if we want to go further, we have to make more connection. So I invite you, I morally invite you to connect to the people around you or with this event, for example. But uh, I think we need to talk more about this, uh, this kind of technology and how we can develop this technology on our countries and in Europe, as Irina said it. So thank you so much for, uh, for being with us uh, tonight. And um, I hope to see you on our next event in June. Uh, you will soon uh, receive an invitation. No worry for that. And um, yep, thank you, SOA, also for organizing and uh, gather all these people. Uh, you're quite amazing, uh, and thank you for for your presentation.
Have a good night. Thank you, Ludivine. Bye. Thank you so much, all. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.